we actually build new construction homes. And in order to build new construction homes, we started to acquire land 10 years ago. And we continue to acquire land more than we sell every single year. Last year, we bought 992 properties. You're listening to The Life & Money Show, a podcast that brings you the stories and strategies of people who are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth for their families, and impacting the world around them. And now here are your hosts, Annie Dickerson and Julie Lamb. Hey, everyone. Annie Dickerson here together with my fabulous co-host, Julie Lamb. Julie, how are you today? I'm doing good. I'm pretty happy right now because the sun is shining. (laughs) But no, it's a good time right now. I feel like lots of good stuff on the horizon. And what's going on with you? Yeah. Well, speaking of stuff on the horizon, to give our listeners a little bit of a glimpse into the behind the scenes of what we've been doing at Good Egg Investments. We were just talking about this yesterday and how we've seen such tremendous growth over the months. And over the last couple months in particular, we've been focused really on reinvesting internally into the business and for our investors And we rolled out a brand new investor portal. We brought new people onto the team. Our team is growing. So all sorts of exciting things. And I know in many ways we've accomplished a lot, but we always say we still feel like we're at the starting line. There's so much more to do. And we're this year we'll be in business. We'll have been in business for about four years, which at the same time seems like a really long time. It seems like it's gone by in a flash. I don't know. What do you think? (laughs) My God, in a flash. I mean, I was thinking about this randomly last night too. I was like, my gosh, like where did the years go? And what's crazy is two of those years were spent in COVID. And so the first two seems like eons ago when we used to hang out and we'd go and we'd meet up in the city and do all this fun stuff. And then we've spent the second half of the last four years in COVID where we meet all the time like this over Zoom. Wow, it's gone by in a flash. It's just, and I guess that's, it's what they say, right? When you're having fun and time goes by quick, it's like when you're a kid and you're like sitting in class and you're like, gosh, when is it going to be like lunchtime or whatever? And it (laughs) seems like forever. Well, this was like the complete opposite of that, where it's just like, get up every day and do fun stuff and have a blast too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just going, it's like warp speed, but I wish I had the statistics in front of me, but it's something like the majority of businesses fail in the first year, right? And then by the three-year mark, it's even more. And by the five-year mark, 10-year mark, and it gets less and less and less down to like less than 1% after 10 years time. And the reason I bring that up is partly because of our guest today, Greg Cohen, He's one of the co-founders at JWB Real Estate Capital, and he and his partners have been in business for 16 years. So they got into real estate at a really good time in 2006 when anybody could get into it and feel like they were kings. (laughs) And so that's exactly what they did. They got into it in 2006, wholesaling and doing, trying a whole lot of different things. And then 2008 handed them their hats and they realized, wait a second, this is a little harder than we thought. And what's really interesting about their story is while everything was falling apart, there was one area of their business that was still doing really well during that time. And then since then, they've shifted the focus of their entire business to focus specifically on turnkey rental properties. And that's how they serve their clients today. And they've built such a unique business model, which we dive into in the show. Yeah, it was, wow, he put out some impressive numbers. First of all, we talk about this in the show, but being in business for 16 years in this market too, and being committed to this market is the thing that really impresses me. Having worked with a number of turnkey companies, not a lot of them can say they've been around for that long. And if you're not serving your investors right, and you're not taking care of them and producing returns, your business isn't going to grow and you're not going to stick around for 16 years. So it says a lot about, and in the show, we talk a lot about their approach and how they're different from other turnkey companies, which I think if anybody out 
there is interested in diversifying your portfolio away from multifamily and wants to get into some turnkey stuff, Annie and I have both done some smaller rental properties of our own as well. Talking with a company like this that is vertically integrated, has the PM company in-house and has been around for, for this long, just says a lot. And so we go into a lot of numbers. I asked about price points so that you guys can get an idea of like, well, how much is it going to cost? I think probably for 20, well, no, not 20, probably like, I think he said like 30, 40,000 down, you could get into something with some pretty good cash flow and also be invested in the Florida market, which is where they're based and the work that they're doing to, this is what really impressed me was the work that they're doing to make the areas that they're investing into better. I don't know of any turnkey companies that have an interest in that. They're usually like, here, I'm going to sell you the property and I'll manage it for you. So they're on the hook for that. But once they sell you the property, if the market changes or turns, they're like, well, it is what it is. And so the fact that they're just so heavily invested into that was really impressive for me. They certainly have deep roots in the community. And at the end of the show, he talks about how every year they build a house, brand new house, and they give it to a veteran in the community. And so they're just giving back on all different levels and really committed and invested, not only in these individual properties, but in the market at large. So there's a ton that we get into in this episode. Um, For any of our listeners who might be interested in passive investing either through turnkey properties, as Greg will be talking about, or through multifamily syndication, we have a great place for you to start, which is to grab a copy of our book. It's called Investing for Good. We have a free copy for all of you. Just go to goodeginvestments.com slash book. And with that, let's dive into our conversation with Greg Cohen. Greg, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you guys so much for having me on the show. I can't wait. Absolutely. Now, Greg, I know that at JWB Real Estate Capital, you help people to invest in real estate in the Jacksonville, Florida market with a focus on turnkey rental properties. And before we dive deeper into how that works, why turnkey, why Jacksonville, I want to take us back a little bit earlier in your story. So start by telling us how you got into real estate in the first place. Well, it certainly wasn't by design or intention. Growing up, I did not come from an entrepreneurial family or a real estate family. And going to college, all I learned was go to college, get good grades so you can get a good job. And that's what I tried really hard to do. And so was uh, was blessed to get a good job coming out of college, worked for a Fortune 500 company, here in Jacksonville, which is what brought me to Jacksonville. But I just found that that fit was not right for me. It was two years kind of where- What work were you doing? I was, uh, well, they told me I was going to be in finance, but they turned me into accounting and I'm not much of an accountant. So that didn't work <laughs> out so well. And you know, the thing about it was, it was just an environment for me that was not team centric. And my personal experience was something that was really deflating and, and depressing for me. It was a low point in my life. And Looking back on it now, obviously it has led to something much greater, but I remember how difficult it was going through that at that time. Yeah, I can't even imagine. So you go in, it's like a bait and switch, right? You go in thinking you're going to do one thing. You get into this the corporate world. You're sort of starting to climb the ladder. They switch you over. You're doing something that you didn't intend to do. And so tell us a little bit more about that low point. So were you like, were you thinking, okay, well, maybe this is just isn't the right career for me. I'm going to switch or go back to school. Or what were the, some of the options you were thinking about at the time? Growing up for me, I placed a lot of my self-worth in getting a good job, really. It's kind of tough to admit, but I remember those days. And, and I remember how excited it was when I got a signing bonus to get this job and how proud my parents were and how proud I was. And so when that didn't work out, it was really kind of drove to my core. It made me question why I worked so hard and what what my career could be. It, it really shook me. And from that moment, I remember working with other friends who were in a similar space, maybe not taking it so much to heart, but they suggested books to read. And we started to look into other things. And one of the books they suggested for me to read was a book that absolutely changed my life, which is the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I hope all of your listeners have read. That book changed my life. And I remember literally uh, at, a, at a tough moment, picking up that book. It was about nine o'clock at night. I read that book all the way till two o'clock in the morning, finished the book. And I remember looking at myself in the mirror and saying, I'm going to quit my job and start my own real estate investment company. 
And like I mentioned, if you knew me growing up, that is, that's not, that wasn't me. This book really, really created an epiphany for me that there was an opportunity and a responsibility that I had to mind my own business. Well, that doesn't mean jumping ship, quitting your job and starting your own real estate investment company. It can mean that, or it can mean working in a job that you love, but thinking beyond that active paycheck and really minding your own business outside of that as a way to financial freedom. It seems like that marathon reading session from nine to two really changed. It was like a turning point in your life, not only in terms of what you were doing with work and then real estate investing, but a mindset shift. It sounds like a major mindset shift, whereas before you had been told up to this point, go to college, get good grades, get a good job. And then all of a sudden you had this epiphany, wait a second, there's this whole other way of doing things. And so I'm curious what happens next, because people always tell us about the thing, the turning point. And then there's a lot of hard work though that comes after that. So you read the book, you closed the book at 2 a.m. You probably took a while to go to sleep because you were so excited about about all these new ideas. Then you wake up the next day. What did you do then? Well, there was still a lot of work to be done mentally for me. I saw what I wanted, but I was scared. And it wasn't part of my upbringing to actually make that leap. And But I was curious. I knew there was something there. So I grabbed one of my best friends. He and I had been best friends since high school and lived together in college. And we had always kicked around the idea of something, working together after college and maybe starting a company or something. We didn't really know what that meant, but we were like, oh yeah, we'll do that one day. And I grabbed him and I said, hey, listen, this book changed my life. Like, I want to do this. Why don't you read the book? And I think deep down knowing his name is Alex, he's one of my business partners. And I know Alex to the core and he is a serial entrepreneur. And I knew that if I was actually going to get the courage to do this, he was the guy who was going to push me over the edge. I don't know if I ever verbalized that to him, but I got him included in the process of starting to learn. And we did whatever we could to learn more. We went to the local real estate investment association groups. We didn't have any money at that point. And so we did anything for free that we could do, take people out to lunch as much as we could. And what we quickly established is that we saw an opportunity here. We wanted to treat this like a business rather than a hobby, which is what we found most people did and still do when it comes to real estate. Like I said, I still had a lot of work to do. So I was living in Jacksonville and my friend, Alex, who knows me to the core as well, put his own marketing campaign together to get his buddy to jump ship and actually go forward with with starting this business. Alex lived in Gainesville at that time. And he moved to Jacksonville without really asking me. He moved into my apartment and just decided that he was going to sleep on my couch. And his plan was that he was going to make sure that I saw him every time that I got up in the morning and I was depressed about the next nine hours of my day as I was going to work. I was going to see him on the couch searching for properties and going out and having fun, starting a business and checking properties and learning how the numbers work. And lo and behold, after a few weeks of seeing that, it convinced me and and Alex and I officially started this thing. Oh, it sounds like what a blessing to have a best friend whose skill sets and whose what they bring to the table is so complimentary with yours. I know for a lot of people, sometimes it doesn't work out or the timing doesn't line up, the interests don't line up. But it sounds like for you guys, it lined up perfectly. And it's always nice to have a surprise couch surfer in the midst. (laughs) It is certainly a motivating factor. Yeah. So he came, he moved to Jacksonville. He started looking for properties and you guys were networking. You were building your sort of building your network. What were you guys looking for? Were you looking to buy a single family home in the Jacksonville area? Were you looking to flip something? Tell us a little bit more about that first deal. Well, and this was back in 2006, which was an interesting year in the market, right? In 2006, anybody in real estate could have success because the market was on fire. And for us, one thing we really learned early on was that if we wanted to treat this like a business, we wanted to manage risk along with this. As you can tell, just by Alex and myself, this is probably more of my (laughs) role going into this. How do we manage risk while we're going to this? And one of the ways that we learned how to manage risk while becoming good at this business was a term called wholesaling, which is an active way of going into real estate and finding undervalued properties and then selling those contracts to an eventual investor who's going to renovate the property and make a profit. And that was a way for us to understand what 
the Jacksonville real estate market was to limit the capital needs, to limit the risk of actually having to renovate homes and to generate a quick profit, which is really important when you're a couple of 23-year-old kids trying to survive. And so that's what we really started out doing in the first year. And like I mentioned in 2006, you know, there was a, everybody thought they were good at real estate. So we thought we were good at real estate in 2006. <laughs> so we started to do more, right? If you're good in the beginning, start to do more. So we started to do more and, and we really tried every avenue of real estate. If I kind of move forward a couple of years now, wholesaling was how we got started. We flipped high-end homes. We flipped low-end homes. We did lease options, seller financing, you name it. We, we tried it and did it. We also spent a considerable amount of time learning about debt and learning about how to acquire rental properties that produce positive cash flow. And so in about the first year and a half, we acquired a portfolio of about 40 rental properties here in Jacksonville. And that was one part of what we were doing. Now we were doing a lot. We were kind of a jack of all trades at that point, really a master of none. And at the same time, this was 2007 and 2008. And you know, Annie... Julie, you remember what happened in oh, 2007 yeah. and 2008 I'm, in real I'm estate? I'm gripping the edge of that. my chair because I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Know. So you're building, building, building. You're seeing all this success. So tell us what happened. Well, if you were in real estate in 2006 and you thought you were good because everybody was making some money in 2007 and 2008, of course, the opposite side of that happened too. All of those things that we thought we were good at, we quickly realized that we weren't. The market was falling it fell 35% here from 2007 to 2010 here in Jacksonville and across the country. And it was a really tough moment for us. We lost a lot of money in all areas of the business, except for one, these rental properties. And we spent so much time trying to manage the business on all of these active ways of generating income in real estate. And we realized we weren't good at those, but the 40 rental properties that we had continue to produce positive cash flow. And I remember realizing that even though the market value dropped for those rental properties, those were my retirement account, right? I, I wasn't going to sell them no matter what. So it didn't matter that the value of those properties dropped on paper. And so that was an equally important epiphany for myself and Alex. And I have an additional business partner at that time too. His name is Adam Regal. And the three of us did a, just a look at what was working, what wasn't because rental properties were, everything else wasn't. And at the same time, people had kind of been asking about our journey being 23, 24 years old. You know, how did you actually buy 40 rental properties? That's not normal. And so with the state of our business at that point, we said, we need to make a shift. And what we realized is that we had something really working underneath our nose, which was our rental property portfolio. And we had some semblance of demand because people were asking us about us. We're like, let's go to that. Let's figure out how to build a business to replicate what we had done for ourselves and create this experience of owning rental properties for the masses out there, for everyday people, and create this wonderful experience for people to actually build a portfolio and, and hold on to it for the long haul. And through the great trial and tribulation of everything else not working, figuring out that this was our hedgehog, this was the thing that we were built to do. Fast forward now, it's been 16 years that. We're in business here in, in Jacksonville doing the same thing, focusing on our turnkey rental properties and property management. And we've had the, the blessing to serve over 1,300 clients now. They come to us from 49 states and 13 countries. The only one is not, the only state that we don't have yet is West Virginia. We're dying for our next client from West Virginia, hopefully. And we manage over 4,300 rental properties here in Jacksonville. And all in all, get to manage over 750 million of real estate assets some 16 years later. And it's been an incredible journey. Wow. Well, for any listeners who are from West Virginia, you heard the call. <laughs> you heard the call. Get someone. in touch with Greg. <laughs> I know someone. I'm going to I'm gonna reach out so that I can be like, Greg, I hooked you up. I mean, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. That's funny. Wow. That's such an incredible journey. I, I can't even imagine. I always like to say that things happen for a reason. You don't always know when you're going through it, why. And it may feel like the worst thing in the world that's happening. And you're like, why is this happening to me? And you luckily had the foresight to look at it and, and say, well, gosh, okay, this isn't working anymore in this state we're in. But what is working? And I think that's always important to look 
at your business and ask yourself that question because I think so many times you get caught up in like, this is what I do. This is what I'm familiar with. I'm going to make this work. And you have to ask like, what's working? What are people drawn to? Like you said, there were people asking you like about your journey and asking you about the rental properties. And so it's great that you listen to that because here you are 16 years later. So that's awesome. 16 years. Wow. That's a, know, that's right? a long time. You're not committed to this space. <laughs> 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 oh man, oh man. I can't do anything now, right? 16 years is making me feel old as I say that and that number grows yeah. every single year. But but that's awesome because I know a lot of us have a lot of people, real estate has become wildly popular, I think, in the last five years or so. It seems like to me anyway. But you've been in the business now for 16 years. So that's such a long time. I'm curious, you've probably seen a lot over that time. Obviously, 2009 happened um, somewhere in the middle of all of that. When you think about investors owning rental properties, so you're doing turnkey stuff. So you guys are finding rental properties and then selling it kind of the same. It's a mix, a little bit of the wholesale, right? Because, But I guess you're... Explain what that process actually yeah, is. Yeah, I'd love to because the term turnkey now means a lot of different things to different people. When we started... 16 years ago, nobody ever used the term turnkey. So I thought it was pretty cool when we would explain turnkey and everybody's like, wow, I know what that is. Now nobody knows what it is, right? It means different things to different people. I'll kind of define what turnkey is. And then what we are is actually a little bit different than your normal turnkey company. Turnkey companies are here to create an experience where the property is purchased ahead of time. And then they sell that property to an investor and then they do the property management. And if it's a, if it really is turnkey, then all of that is the same company. They actually own the property ahead of time. They would sell it to you, Julie, as an investor. And that same property management companies is in the same walls. It's the same company. Many companies out there use the term turnkey, but none of those processes are under one roof. They don't actually close on the properties. They just represent people, maybe. They don't do the property management. They refer you to another property management company. And I, I just think that that may work for some investor, but if you're looking for a passive experience, you really need to work with one company that does, does all of it. So that's one threshold, the turnkey company threshold. We're vertically integrated, which I think is a different threshold. I think it's a higher threshold. And I think it works more for a, an investor that is investing for a full market cycle because a vertically integrated company does what a true turnkey company should do but they are also here to think longer, right? So JWB, we don't just go out and buy properties today for the properties that our clients have the demand for. We actually build new construction homes. And in order to build new construction homes, we started to acquire land 10 years ago. And we continue to acquire land more than we sell every single year. Last year, we bought 992 properties. We'll get back to our conversation with Greg in just a minute. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but aren't sure you have the time or the desire to manage the investment? Perhaps you're afraid like we were that you'll make the mistake of choosing the wrong market or the wrong team and lose your entire investment. Well, that's exactly why we created the Good Egg Investor Club. We do the work of identifying solid real estate investment opportunities in the best markets around the country and then partner with you to acquire these investments and then we'll all share in the returns. We'll identify the growing markets, strong, experienced teams, and the solid deals. We do all the heavy lifting of managing the tenants and the renovations, and as a passive partner, you get to enjoy all the benefits of investing in real estate, monthly cash flow, long-term appreciation, and the ongoing tax benefits. When we first discovered passive investing through real estate syndications, we realized it fit perfectly into our busy lives. We could put our money to work for our families, work less, and get more time back in our days so that we could focus on what matters most and discover our true passion and purpose in life. We've now helped hundreds of people invest passively in real estate syndications and are seeing the positive impact it's had on their lives. We invite you to partner with us by joining the Good Egg Investor Club today so you can start putting your money to work for you and get more time back in your day because we know that when people have more time in their days, they can do the true work they were intended to do and the world will be a better place. To sign up for the Good Egg Investor Club, go to goodegginvestments.com invest and we'll take it from there. 
That's goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And now back to our chat with Greg Cohen. Last year, we sold about 500 and we continue to do that every single year. So we stockpile land that our clients are going to need in future years that are going to turn into cash flowing investments. So you're thinking broader in the beginning. You're making sure that your clients can actually accomplish their cash flow and their passive income goals. And then on the back end, right, you're community focused. You're focused in the social, the economic, the political goings on of your area, and you're committed to one market, right? You can't be vertically integrated in every market, but there's a lot of companies out there that go in multiple markets. And the reason why this matters is because the best way to win in owning rental properties is to buy and hold for a full market cycle. You know, that's how you get the maximum impact from all five profit centers in real estate, but you need time. You need to hold on to them for a full market cycle. And there is a lot that you can do as a vertically integrated company to impact median incomes in your area, in your community. And you do that by making investments. You do that by being on the boards of the organizations that actually make decisions locally. Because if you're not focused on doing the things long-term and if you control a lot of money and you're not thinking about doing the things long-term to raise median incomes, ultimately there's a cap on what the return on investment can be for your clients. Because no matter what supply and demand does, if homes are unaffordable because median incomes don't rise, the home values are not going to go up. So a vertically integrated thinks much longer. They're solving problems, not just for today, not just collecting rent, which is a big issue they need to be great at, but they're also solving 10-year and 20-year problems down the road because that's how long you need to keep your money invested to win in rental properties. Yeah. Wow. That I have never heard, and I've worked with a few myself, I've never heard of a turnkey company taking that perspective before. This really long-term approach, I've always felt like I pop into this system of theirs, they sell me a house and they're great. And they're in-house, just like you said, some are, some aren't, but my property manager's in-house But to take the initiative within the community to have a desire to improve the average household income in the area, like, wow, for the benefit of your investors, not only today and yesterday, but for the ones coming on board, that's incredible. That's like, wow, that's so awesome. And I feel like the only way that you can do that is by having such a strong focus in a centralized area, right? Because if you are here, there, and everywhere, which a lot of them are, they're like, we've found a system that works here in wherever, right? And then they're like, we're going to go duplicate the system in another market, in another market. But they don't have that investment of time, like you're saying, because you guys are so focused on this market. So that's That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about, so the properties that folks are buying are new construction. Is that, did I understand that correctly? So you're buying the land, building the new construction, and then then you're offloading it to an investor, but you remain in as the property manager, but these are new builds. So these are like what we call in multifamily class A new build, which comes with a lack of deferred maintenance, which when I think of turnkey, some of them take them down to the studs and renovate, but right. some of them are in these like C-class areas. Yeah. And as a rental property owner, you get all the trouble after yeah. they sell it to you. And <laughs> sure, they're there to property manage, but it's no fun. Annie's, that's a whole nother oh, show. Yeah. We can talk about <laughs> rental properties and the phone calls that Annie's gotten on some of her stuff and sure, mine sure. too. So tell us a little bit about that. I want to understand that. And I want our listeners to understand that a little bit more, what the process looks like, what the price points are, what kind of rents you're seeing on these newer builds. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about the, like, this is, there is no perfect investment out there. So let's also talk about some of the things that are not going to be the flashiest or the greatest or the, the things that most folks would find appealing, right? And I'm dive straight into neighborhoods, Julie, because you mentioned it, all right? What I heard you mention was maintenance cost, right? And vacancy cost are high and we want to avoid that. And when you're talking about new builds, right? For in multis, we talk about like, location or we talk about like type of build, right? A new build would be kind of like a class A build, right? But the location that we are investing in are below middle income neighborhoods. So when you mention C neighborhoods, I'm going to dive right in because we love C neighborhoods. (laughs) The thing about it though, is the end goal, we want to invest in C neighborhoods because that's where we can invest in Jacksonville, which is a growth market, which has higher than normal home price appreciation, but that's where we can still get positive cash flow. 
and positive cash flow is critical, right? And we accomplish lowering maintenance and vacancy costs a number of ways. Number one, it's a new build. We also do renovate to a very high standard on certain homes as well, but the majority of our construction is new construction. So that's going to limit your maintenance and your vacancy cost. But we also sign long-term leases. And most property management companies don't sign long-term leases. They only sign one-year leases. And if you only sign one-year leases, inherently, you're going to have more turnover. You're going to have higher maintenance costs. You'll have higher vacancy costs. And you also have higher property management fees to pay. So JWB, our our clients, we sign two and three-year leases with our residents. And we do that even though we know it's a lot more work and even though we knowingly give up income on the property management side because it's going to produce a better return on investment and allow us to have low maintenance costs, low vacancy costs, even though we are investing in below middle income neighborhoods. So I'm just curious, Julie and Annie, I know you guys are very seasoned. Have you heard of most property management companies signing one-year leases on single family rentals? Most of the time. Oh yeah. That's pretty standard. I have heard of a few that do two-year leases, but sometimes, and I'd be curious to hear what your response is to this. Sometimes what I see is that the trajectory of the rent in two years ago is not where it will be in two years. So you sign them to this two-year lease, but then the rent has gone up significantly since then and hasn't really caught up, even though you built in some kind of an escalation in their rent over that two-year period. How do you guys handle that? Especially in a growth area like Florida, yeah. right? Where today you rent it for 1500 and in two years, it could be 17 or 1800 but to lock them into that lease right off the bat would seem kind of aggressive. I don't know. How do you handle that? I love that question. It's a great question. And you know, we live in such a wonderful time right now. What a great asset class that we're talking about potentially limiting rent growth. Like it wasn't always that way 16 years ago, right? I, it's a new challenge that we talk about. But one of the things that I think a lot of investors fail to think about is just how costly a turnover is, right? A turnover, when you add it all up, costs between five to six thousand dollars per turn when you include the cost of a renovation, you include the cost of vacancy, right? the lost rent that they incur. And then you also include full month's tenant placement fee, or maybe even a half month, depending on what that service provider is. right? So you add all those things together, and that is a huge cost. And so while we all want to maximize rents, if I knew with confidence that I could just keep my resident in my house for 10 years or longer, I would honestly be very lenient on rent increases and I would win at the end because I would defer those five or six thousand dollar hits. You're you're just not going to make it up enough in your, you know, five percent or eight percent rent increases each year to offset a five thousand or six thousand dollar hit. And so that's always been our approach, right? Long-term leases are going to allow you to have that turnover cost less have that property management fee last. So our average resident stays over four and a half years in one of our homes. And that, of course, pushes that cost down the line. And the great thing is we don't see cost increasing. If you have that cost once a year, it's still going to cost you about five or six grand. If you have that cost six years down the road, it's still going to cost you five or six grand. So that's really the mentality. Now, I will tell you that we do get rent escalations and rent increases as a part of our long-term leases. So we do get that. But this concept of getting 8% rent increases year over year, been doing this for 16 years. This is the only year that we've ever seen 8% rent increases. So would I be happy with a 3% rent increase and make sure that I was deferring that five or six grand offset or cost and down the road, I would take that trade every day. And that's really the mentality of what clients like that. Right. Yeah. No, that definitely makes sense. And those turnover costs are real. Tenants leave and not always can you recapture that from their deposit. It's not a lot of times it's not enough. Barely covers anything. <laughs> it's yeah. mainly just like the wear and tear that it covers. But when you start having to think about replacing things, that's when those numbers get pretty high and the time that it sits vacant for. But I would assume in a market like this that the vacancy time period is not very long. I mean, I don't know what you tell us. What do you guys see? Yeah, you're right. You know, managing 4,300 homes, we get a great snapshot of the market here, the, the rental market here in Jacksonville. And I'll tell you, like I run marketing for us and this is the easiest time to market and lease out homes, right? I mean, days on market are incredibly low. 
And I don't want to diminish the efforts of our leasing team because our leasing team is amazing. But just like market dynamic, you never want to get in the, in the way of market dynamics. You want to be riding the market dynamics. We are riding the market dynamics when it comes to leasing homes. Days on market historically, on average, are about 40 days on market during a turn for a JWB home from the time it hits the market to the time that it's filled with a paying resident. And now over the past year, it's been about 20, 25. So yeah, absolutely. Just reinforcing the point that you made there. What's driving a lot of the growth in Florida? I know that we've invested in multifamily there in Florida and continue to be pretty interested in that market, but tell the audience what's driving a lot of that. Is it jobs? Is it headquarters moving there? Talk to us a little bit about that. There's a lot of things that are driving people to Florida. A lot of them are not new, right? The no state income taxes, the weather, right? The fact that there's beaches here, especially in Jacksonville. There are new things that are driving people to Florida and COVID has driven a lot of people to states like Florida and Texas. But you know, I just did a deep dive on population growth. So if I had to lump everything together, what's driving home price appreciation and what's driving rent price appreciation is that the demand for housing is greater than the supply of housing. And the greatest measure of demand for housing really is population growth. So if you're an investor and you're investing for the long haul, you want to look to see what populations over the long haul have been growing at a faster rate because they probably got something that's attracting people. That's probably going to attract the same number of people or more over the next real estate cycle, right? So I actually just did a deep dive on the US census data. And what I came to find, and this is all available on the US census for anybody that wants to see it, but you know, I went and I looked at over the last, let's see, it was 2017 to 2019. That's the latest data that's available. And the average population growth across the entire US is 1%. In many cash flow markets out there, you're actually seeing less than 1% population growth. And that's because in many cash flow markets, you think in the Midwest and people are, are not, they're not staying there. They're leaving. They're going to other places. Jacksonville's population growth over that same time period is 3.6% the fifth fastest growing MSA in the country. And so when you think about why are prices going up so much, why are rents going up so much? A lot of that comes to the fact that we grew at 3.6 times the national average when it comes to population growth. And that was even before COVID. That was 2019. Those trends have just been accelerated because of a lot of things that have happened over the last two years. And I would expect as we do this data in two years and look back over the COVID period, will go up from the fifth fastest growing. It'll probably be much higher because the data is showing that people are moving to places like Florida and Jacksonville. Yeah. Now this is leads nicely into the next question that I was going to ask you is around COVID. How has COVID impacted your business and how has it affected your renters or not your renters, but your investors' properties? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. It's interesting. So I started to do our own show and we started in January of 2020 and I was super super scared. Like you guys do such a great job with the show, by the way, you make it look easy and sound easy. You know, we were when there I started, once too at the beginning. <laughs> it's scary, right? In the Ooh, beginning. It is. Right? Yeah. So for me, we kicked off our show in January, really in February of 2020. I'm sorry, of 20. Yeah. 2020. Goodness. I'm getting my years mixed up. One month before COVID really broke in the United States, right? March, 2020, the world was crazy. So that was a really scary time. I remember our investors, me, everybody, right? Everybody was scared in the country. We'd never dealt with this before. And when you're managing a significant amount of wealth for individuals, they're looking at you to understand what's going to happen next. And I didn't have all the answers, but I remember being on that show and just, I said, here's what I know. There's a lot that I don't know, right? When we would do a client call and, and have our clients, I said, I'm glad that I'm investing in a critical need right now. I'm investing in a critical need, which is housing. And housing is a critical need for individual and a housing is a critical need for the government to work well. And while I don't know how this is going to go, and if I look at other asset classes, those are not critical needs. And so I'm happy that I'm here. I would expect that this asset class will perform more consistently than other asset classes simply because of that fact. That's really the extent of, I think, anybody's knowledge at that point. But if you look at what had happened, what has happened since then, those basic fundamentals have played out, right? People want to stay in their homes, even though we had an eviction moratorium, which in essence gave people the opportunity to not pay rent and still stay in their homes for a short period of time. Rent collection for single family assets, single family rental properties still remained quite high. And that's even beyond just JWB. 
our rent collection during the year 2020 actually was 98%, 98% of rents collected. And of course, you know, our typical rent collection rates in a non-COVID year is 98 and a quarter percent. So when you think about this asset class, it has performed so well. Right now, single family rental properties are like the darling asset class because of rent growth, because of home price growth, and because of how well real estate and rental properties perform against inflation, which is the big topic right now. It's a huge hedge against inflation. And so there's a lot of dollars, both from single family mom and pop investors, which is what I am, which is who we serve, the, the, the folks that buy between maybe five to 15 properties in a portfolio, and also the Wall Street guys and ladies up there that just in the last year and a half, $30 billion of Wall Street money has gone specifically towards build to rent single family assets, and many in places like Florida where population growth is the highest. So all in all, there were certainly scary times, but the same foundational reasons why this asset class has performed so well for decades have rang true for COVID when it comes to rent collection. Wow. Those numbers are impressive. Your collection, I mean, wow. Similar for us across all of our properties through COVID, there were a few where we had some issues, but at the end of the day, I think people realize like if nothing else throughout COVID, I need a place to live <laughs> yeah. like, because of the way this thing spreads and the whole thing. It was like, if nothing else, I need to be able to stay in my home. Even with the eviction moratorium, I know I'll, at some point I'll have to face that if exactly. I don't pay my rent, right? So I think we saw very much of the same across our portfolio as well. All right. Oh, one quick question I wanted to ask before we transition is I wanted to understand what the price point is so that yeah. anyone who's listening who might think, oh, this sounds really great. I want to work with Greg, but I have no idea, right? Is the price points of, and I have no idea. So I'm curious too. <laughs> Are these properties in the hundred thousands, two hundred thousands? Talk to us about that. Yeah. So and our average tag price. Onto that. Real quick, if you could also cover sort of, because a lot of our listeners want to get into real estate, they want to be passive. You know, they want to put their money in, they don't want to do the work. So in addition to the price point, could you also talk to us about what is the typical investor's responsibility in investing in a turnkey? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful question. So on a price point level, our average purchase prices will be between about 180 to 280,000. And so in the Jacksonville market, your median home price is about 310,000. So we're right in that below middle income, kind of like right, we're not low income. We're not going to low income areas, we're below middle income. And so for a, a property that sells for about 225,000, your average rents might be about 1350 for that rental property. And you're able to produce positive cash flow because of low property taxes, because of high rents, and because of low property insurance costs, especially for new construction homes. And Annie, you bring up a, a great question. It's more than just the return on investment. Oh, and actually I should just point out your average returns on investment for these properties will be between seven to 9%. And that's just based on your cash flows, not based on home price appreciation. So seven to 9%. And, but I think it goes well beyond just earning a seven to 9% return for our typical investor. They may be investing in other things that they just might feel like they have too much in the stock market or in bonds aren't performing much right now. They're looking for an alternative to bonds or looking to diversify. And, and real estate's probably always had an interest level for them, but they lived in California. Maybe they live in the Bay Area. Maybe hopefully they live in West Virginia and they <laughs> just haven't found a market or a team to support for them. I think the way that big reason that people do not invest in real estate is not because they don't feel like the returns are high enough. It's because of the experience that they feel like they have to have they feel like real estate is hard. Actually, there's a recent poll by Gallup out there and they, they asked Americans, what do you believe the best long-term investment is? And real estate was number one. It was the majority. That's really no surprise, right? You talk to people down the street, real estate is a fun asset class to talk about. People, people see an opportunity there. But they asked those same Americans, what do you have in your financial portfolio? And real estate was not number one not number two, was not number three, was not number four. It was the fifth most popular choice below bonds, which when they asked folks, what's the best investment long-term? Only 5% of people said bonds, but it, it, was, it was 50% when it came to actually what's in their portfolio. And to me, that comes down to experience. So Andy, thank you for the question. When folks come to JWB, it's equal parts. They're looking for an asset that can earn an above average return on investment. 
but it is all about the client experience. They want to work with a team of professionals that is their eyes and ears, that has their back, that is their professional management, more than just a property manager, almost like an asset manager, almost like a financial engineer for them to be able to maximize their return on investment. And they don't want to do any of the work. Like It is okay to invest in a property and not go and view it. right? Just like investors all the time do their due diligence on a mutual fund or on a stock, they don't go to that company and go and sit down with the CEO of that company. right? So our clients would look at that in a similar way that they want to find a team of professionals to handle their real estate, call it their real estate mutual fund. It's not a mutual fund. They own each property, but it's the same mentality, right? We can manage these things from afar. We can deliver on the return expectations and maximize their returns. On a monthly basis, we have a monthly call. We have a client service team. We have a team of over 80 individuals here at JWB, but everybody has a client service teammate that we have a monthly call set up and we get to review their performance tracking on a monthly basis. We get to talk about what their buying plan is. We understand what their goals are and what their plan is. And and we simply get to keep adding properties to the portfolio. And on a transactional level, of course, there's a client portal for them to be able to log in and see transactions and rents collected. If there's a maintenance item, it's all there. And that client service team and that client service experience is, is paramount. And it's what I think separates this investment with JWB versus many other opportunities out there. That's awesome. Thank you for that explanation. And yeah, it's interesting on the cash flow part, going back to that, the 7 to 9%, I think you said, is where it falls. I think investors have to also take into consideration when you're investing in something like this, that there are many benefits just beyond the cash flow. You're getting the loan paid out and you're also getting the appreciation, which a market like this could be a big part of that equation as well. So something to kind of think about. All right. Well, we're going to transition into the life and money show spotlight round where we're going to ask you a couple of questions around life and money. So the first question is, what is one thing that you're doing right now to live a meaningful and intentional life by design? I love this part of the show and I love this question. Thank you for just kind of expanding our minds beyond just returns on investment. So I'll tell you what I was doing just in the hour before we jumped on the podcast here. One of my family goals is that I want to leave a legacy for my kids. And I want them to understand how awesome they are and how awesome our family is and how awesome like the process of growing up has been with my wife and my kids. I have a nine-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son. And about four years ago, I started an online journal that I turn into a book every year and I give it to 25 friends and family members. And it's been really fun and engaging. Well, this year I wanted to step it up. So I actually just was meeting with kind of, I guess you'd call it a ghostwriter. He's going to help me like translate all the stories that I get to tell about my family every single day. And we're going to put this entire book together. So I'm meeting with him every single week now, just talking about telling stories and helping me memorialize these stories. And so I get to envision, well, I envision putting this into a super duper book to share with my kids, my wife, it'll be there forever for us and kind of remember on a week by week basis, the amazing things that life has kind of blessed us with. So oh my that's what gosh. I'm doing. That is so fun. That's so cool to be committed to something like that for years and years and years. I journal here and there. It hasn't been a priority, but what fun to be able to have something to hand off to your grandchildren when that day and time comes and for them to see the day in the life. How fun. That's so awesome. I, I love think so that. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So cool. All right. Second question is around others' life and money. So what is one life or money hack that you can share that will make an impact in others' lives right now? I'm just literally going from the last three hours of my life when I'm pulling these things. But on the way to work today, I was talking to our accountant and I uncovered a way to help pay for my kids. We go to a private school. They're in second and fourth grade. And so I uncovered a way to save taxes on paying for that private school education. And now I'm no CPA out there. Go get your own CPA and follow their advice. But with a 529 plan, which is a college savings plan, you can take the growth from those investments and actually use that growth to pay for my kids' tuition for second grade and fourth grade at private school. And I didn't know this before. It really hasn't been around for that long, meaning the option to pay for private school education and before it was just college education. So yeah, so this is what I'll be doing now. And there's a a strategy that I worked out and I would encourage all of you to look more into it. But yeah, you can actually pay for elementary school, middle school, high school tuition with your 529 plans. 
Wow. That's awesome. That's a good one. A lot of our listeners have kids within that age range as well. So that's a good one. I know Annie and I both do as well. So that's cool. Didn't know that. How did you, did your CPA tell you about that or how'd you come across that? It's something my wife loves about me and hates about me. I'm Uh, always thinking about like tax savings. Like it's, oh yeah. (laughs) <laughs> so oh, yeah, yeah. I probably thought about it when I was like going to bed and, you know, yeah. know gave her a kiss good night and just like started thinking about taxing. Yeah. Don't, <laughs> <laughs> don't want to give up that money to the IRS. That's for That's sure. right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last question is around life and money in the world. So what is one thing that you're doing right now to make the world a better place? So really are committed to obviously rental property investments here in Jacksonville and property management, but we share openly with our clients that we think that the property is a widget. The property is a widget, right? Nobody out there gets really, really excited about buying a house that they live thousands of miles away from that another family is going to live in that house for like five years, right? It's not what they get excited about. They think about what this house can do for them to help accomplish their financial goals. And so it's okay to call the property a widget. And everything that we do within JWB is for a much higher purpose than just being good at buying, renovating, building, and collecting rent, right? Our mission is to change people's lives. So we start our own charity called JWB Cares. And each year we build a brand new construction home and we get to donate that home to a veteran in the local community who needs a helping hand with housing. And so we have done this. This will be the third year. This will be the third home. Excuse me. This will be the fourth home. We did this for the past three years. This will be the fourth home that we get to donate. And we do it every year at our charity golf tournament, which is coming up at the end of February. So we think that affordable housing is an issue across the country. In Jacksonville, it's not as much of an issue today, but it's going to be at some point. And we think that the mission of affordable housing is something that we can really impact and change people's lives for the better. And I can just tell you, getting to meet these veterans who receive this home, getting to watch them as they walk across the threshold and get their keys for this brand new home after they've dedicated so much of their lives and their families to serving our country is a very moving experience and something I'm very proud to be a part of. Wow. What a phenomenal venture and just a a great way to add another level to everything that you're doing and also bring all of your clients, your investors alongside you to deepen that impact. And I know you're involved on so many different levels within the Jacksonville market and in all these communities. And so it's just amazing what you're doing. You've almost come full circle, right? You started in finance and then you sort of, "Eh, I don't know if this is right. The account thing. Now you've come full circle. And now not only are you sort of in some ways, you're a financial advisor, but you're in the corner of each of your investors. You're advocating for them. You're helping them to build wealth. So it's an incredible business that you've built. And I know that our listeners are going to want to learn more. So tell them, Greg, what's the best place that they can go? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much to you both and for doing the show and for having me on as a guest. For anybody who'd like to learn more about JWB, you can go to our website, which is jwbmakesiteasy.com, jwbmakesiteasy.com. Or you can find me on social or we do our own show called The Not Your Average Investor Show. And if you'd like to kind of join us and listen to the podcast, you can find that podcast wherever you check out your own podcast. Greg Cohen, co-founder at JWB Real Estate Capital. Greg, thank you so much for being here with us and our listeners today. Thank you so much, guys. You've been listening to The Life and Money Show, the number one podcast for people who, like you, are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth, and making an impact in the world. For more resources, check out goodegginvestments.com and be sure to join the Life and Money Show community on Facebook. And if you got value out of the show, please subscribe and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you amazing new conversations.